We have two experts with us today, Dr. Nasia Safdar, the Medical Director for Infection Control and Prevention at UW Health, and Dr. Jeffrey Potoff, the Chief Quality Officer at UW Health. So we're going to start with Dr. Safdar. She'll kind of give a a brief update of kind of where the status is because it's ever changing, and then she will talk some about our preparedness, but we will open it up for questions, and I've asked who's ever going to answer the questions just to be right in front of the mic so you guys get the best audio. So thank you for coming out, Dr. Safdar. Okay, good morning, everyone. So uh, just in terms of thinking about COVID-19 as this virus moves globally, I think that we are shifting from a standpoint of thinking uh, whether it will come to the U.S. to more from, it seems like community transmission will be inevitable. We've already found it in, in states in the U.S. And so from the health system perspective, it's going to be important for us to think about it from three viewpoints. One is will we have the capacity and the infrastructure to test those who need to be tested and to provide adequate care and evaluation for those that need more management. Uh, the second point is from the workforce planning standpoint, what to think about in terms of healthcare worker health, healthcare worker safety, and being able to have the workforce to deal with the large volumes that may um, come up if that scenario unfolds as it is expected to. And the third thing is to make sure that we have adequate supplies for personal protective equipment, and those include things like N95 respirators, face masks, gowns, gloves, eye protection, and the other things that might be needed to safely deliver and provide care to patients who are suspected or confirmed to have COVID-19. Uh, so a number of steps have been taken within the health systems to ensure our readiness for whatever scenario may unfold. Um, and so we can, some of those are in the press release that was just um, uh, released, but I'm happy to answer questions about any specifics that, that you might have. How many infection isolation rooms do you have and so I think for the negative pressure rooms, we have a number of rooms that are in the ambulatory setting and a number that are within the inpatient setting. And the inpatient setting for us includes not just the university hospital, but the children's hospital and other settings where we, we send our patients to. So I think the adequacy of that depends on how many numbers of patients come into the health system that need care within the health system as opposed to in the ambulatory setting. We are uh, developing and escalating on a progressive plan of care. So if we get a few patients, how will we handle that? If we get more than a few, how will we handle that? And if there's a true surge, what will we do there? So in terms of preparedness, I think we are prepared at the current level for what we think is a likely scenario. The community surge aspects are still being actively developed and planned for. Um, other hospitals around the country have seen thefts of respirator masks. Uh, have you seen any here, and, and what about supplies? So supply is something that we're very carefully monitoring, we're looking at it, in fact, daily to see what our inventory looks like, what we need to order, and how we can best conserve PPE. Uh, it certainly is, a, is, a, is true that masks have been flying off the shelves. I think it's a natural reaction when people are worried in the community about something that might be transmissible. Our approach to that has been to use signage to have more monitoring at those kiosks where we have masks, just to make sure that they're being conserved for the people that really need them, which is someone with symptoms and the healthcare workers that need to take care of them. Can we talk about the stock that you have of N95 respirators, how many the hospital has right now? So it's a changing number because we order more as we, as we need them, but I think from the N95 perspective, we can safely say that we have more than an adequate stock to take care of, of large numbers of patients. The CDC does have guidance for how one can extend the use of N95 respirators when necessary. So ordinarily in a non crisis situation, you might use one respirator one time for one patient, but with the a uh, reuse policy that the CDC has or the guidance that they've put out, a single healthcare worker can reuse that N95 for that same patient on multiple encounters. So that comes in very useful in the inpatient setting where you might have to go back in multiple times, and that extends the life and, of the N95 respirator. Um, at the hearing at the Capitol, I heard one of the officials say, call first. What's your recommendation? I mean, if you have symptoms, you don't know if it's the flu, if, if it's coronavirus, whatever. What do you want people to do? We absolutely recommend that people call first. It, it does two things. One is it allows us to adequately triage them in the sense of where do they need to go next in order to be seen if they need to be seen. And the other is it gives an opportunity to provide reassurance and education to people who might have questions about COVID-19 but don't need to come in person to get those answers. So we absolutely recommend that people do call before they come. In terms of calling, in what situations would someone call and say, you know, I believe I have symptoms, I believe I've been in contact with someone? Would there ever be a situation in which the hospital would turn that person away or recommend they not come in in person? 
No, so the decision about whether they should come in in person depends entirely upon their exposure and what kind of symptoms they have. So anybody that needs to be evaluated in person will always be evaluated in person, regardless of the condition, and that includes COVID-19. The people that may not need testing are those that call in, say, with a relevant travel history, but their symptoms are so mild, they've already turned the corner, they're feeling better. And for those patients, it's probably best to stay at home and self-isolate, but testing is not required. Anyone with more than mild symptoms, so fever, shortness of breath, um, a bad cough, those are people that we would want to evaluate. But again, the calling ahead of time helps us prepare to provide the best care. Dr. Sandra, in your time, Sandra, in your time here, would you say that this is unprecedented for the hospital system to have to take such measures and to, to go to such extremes? I think if, if not unprecedented, it's close to being unprecedented. Uh, we did a similar level of planning for H1N1. It turned out to not be as severe globally as people had anticipated. But of course, when you're planning, you plan for the worst case scenario. So a lot of those documents and protocols are being now brought back to be reviewed in this setting. I do think that this will be different than anything we have ever seen before. What lessons did you learn from the swine flu? So I think the main things we learned there is that you have to really put hard numbers to your workforce and to your capacity and to your supplies. It's easy to underestimate how quickly things will run out if you don't plan adequately for that. Um, and so now that we have learned from the experience of, of China for, for COVID-19, of Washington State, we have a much better idea of what it will take. And so our planning efforts are now focused on making sure that those supplies are there, that the workforce is there, and that we have settings where we can test and treat. Um, currently testing Wisconsin at the two sites, the Hygiene Lab and I forget where the other one was. Milwaukee? Milwaukee. Yeah. We're currently Yes, we are. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just to be clear, if anybody does have any questions, is the, is the hotline their first go-to at this point? Yes. This establishment? Right, Jeff. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And you have the number here. I can talk about that real yeah. quick. So this morning at 10 a.m., uh, UW Health did create um, and is currently staffing a hotline for anybody in the public who has questions about COVID-19, uh, questions about whether or not they need to be seen or treated for COVID-19. Uh, we feel there's a lot of information out there and we wanted to provide an accurate source of information uh, for folks in the community that would have questions about COVID-19. That number is 608-720-5300. Uh, we plan to have that staffed right now from 7 a.m. until 11 p.m. Uh, with plans to try to get that staffed 24-7 over the next several days to a week or two. Has UW Health implemented anything like this before, a, a hotline specifically to answer one question about uh, an epidemic? I'm not aware of UW Health having a hotline to answer a question about one thing like this. Are we copying any other health systems? I forget my ignorance. I don't know if Washington State has mm -hmm. something similar. Uh, is that kind of what we got? I'm, I'm not sure if we're copying other health systems with regards to the hotline, but um, one of the really nice thing with academic medicine is that we collaborate really strongly. So we have been talking to folks that are experiencing um, what is going on in Washington, learning from them, talking to other academic health centers to say, hey, what are you doing about this specific issue or that specific issue? Um, and it's really all hands on deck to figure out how we become best prepared to handle any eventuality. Referring to Washington, I'm sure you've seen some of the myriad of issues some callers have had in terms of long waits, feeling discouraged, not getting answers, maybe needing a direct medical line in order to even get through. How is UW kind of countering those problems that Washington's seeing? Yeah, so UW Health right now, we have an incident command center open. Um, we're meeting uh, daily, most of the day, um, to basically address all of these logistical issues um, that you would want to have addressed before you actually start seeing um, cases in your community. Uh, so that's what we've done. We've got uh, many work groups created, um, a lot of staff um, answering these specific issues that we know would come up uh, if we started to see um, community transmission uh, in Madison, Dane County, or the state. Uh, so that's how, that's how we're trying to get ahead of this. We've got a lot of resources and efforts um, to make sure that we can get this right. Jeff, how confident are you that we are ahead of this at this point? Yeah, I think it's hard to be confident because it's hard to know where the ball is going to be. So I think we've made the transition from uh, where the ball is right now to planning for where the ball might be in the future, uh, but we don't know where that, where that ball will be. Um, I am uh, really encouraged by what our teams have been able to do in just two short days, um, the resources that are available to us, the collaboration we're seeing with um, local officials um, in the state, um, and then other um, health systems across the country to really make sure that we um, can get on top of this the, the best we can. 
was there a trigger or something that made this ball start rolling this week, or was it just... Yeah, I think when we first started talking about the transition, it was um, hearing the same thing as you heard. So cases uh, starting to develop in Italy uh, and Iran and starting to worry that maybe um, the idea that we could uh, solely contain this um, might not hold true into the future. So um, starting to, although still do containment, prepare for what if containment um, doesn't work. On that as well, I mean, Worst case scenario, as we're seeing in California, community transmission where maybe there isn't a direct line in terms of how to trace back where this came from. Is there, you know, a first step or a first line of defense that Madison is taking to prevent that if that pops up here in the community? Yeah, I mean, I think the first line of defense, and uh, I would defer to Dr. Um, Safdar, is we really want the community to practice a couple of key things. So one of the, these is uh, if you're sick, if you have a cough and a fever, um, we don't want you to go to work uh, and be in the public, um, not just for COVID-19, but uh, we've had a really busy flu season. Uh, it would, would hold true for that. Uh, the other thing is really good hand washing. Um, there's been a bit of a run on the alcohol gel. Um, it's also okay to use soap and water, wash for 20 minutes. That is also an effective way to clean your hands. Seconds. What, what did I say? 20 minutes. Oh. <laughs> it would be a sink all day. Sorry about that. Yeah, the, the 20 seconds. Um, uh, that's also an effective way. So those are some uh, kind of public health measures that we would encourage folks in the community to take just to prevent um, spread of, you know, COVID-19 if it gets to our community, but respiratory illnesses in general. You mentioned that you're viewing certain indicators like the cases in Italy and Iran as far as kind of triggering what you do next. What indicators are you looking at when determining when it may no longer be wise or advisable to, to continue with large public gatherings. We're seeing, for instance, other countries like in Europe or Japan are sporting events yep. no longer allowing spectators. They're just playing these games in empty stadiums. Is there something that you're looking for, indicators that would say, hey, maybe we should consider something like that here? I think community transmission or evidence of community transmission. And it really needs to be, I think, a local or a regional decision because it may be that even within a single state there might be one region that's heavier hit than others. But yes, evidence of community transmission would be or should be a trigger to think about whether public gatherings are a good idea. What would be UW Health's next step? Um, we are talking about the hotline, of course we're putting everything in place. If, if things do arise, where would, where would we be? Um, so I think from the standpoint of preparedness, I think we're well on the way to having protocols and plans to prepare for all possible scenarios. I think it really depends what we see happening in the community. If we see that there are individuals developing COVID-19 that need inpatient care, then our focus will then turn towards making sure that we have adequate numbers of supplies and workforce and so on to care for those. If it looks like mostly mild disease here and a lot of calls coming in, then our focus would shift to where that need is. So we want to be agile and prepared for however it unfolds. It is a bit disconcerting, of course, and one doesn't know quite how it's going to unfold. So that's why the preparedness at the moment is focusing on all possible angles. Why is it at the hotline? I mean, the obvious answer is you want to inform people, but were you overwhelmed with calls? I suspect. Well, I think it may be, but you know, it's, it's a service that a health system provides to its patients and to the community. So if it helps people feel reassured, if it gives them direction about where to go, that's also in the health system's best interest to make sure that we keep resources for when people need them for the right time. So uh, I think that this is absolutely the right measure to take at this point to be able to offer this service. And we're prepared to receive the calls, so, so that's good.